everyone for joining us today. Uh, my name is Madison Omen. I'm a conservation coordinator with the North Carolina Wildlife Federation, and I'm going to turn it over to our president of the Island Wildlife Chapter, Virginia Holman, to introduce our guest speakers. Sure. Thanks, Madison. Uh, good afternoon. I'm Virginia Holman. I'm with the Island Wildlife Chapter. We're the North Carolina Wildlife Federation affiliate located in Carolina Beach and we're serving the Wilmington and beach communities right now to improve wildlife habitats through education, cleanups, native plantings, and advocacy. And today we're delighted to host Bald Head Island Conservancy Chief Scientist Dr. Beth Darrow and Pleasure Island Sea Turtle Project Founder and Coordinator Nancy Basupney. Dr. Darrow grew up in Northern Virginia, vacationing with her family in Delaware and Cape Cod as a child. And she participated in naturalist programs and developed a passion for coastal ecology there. She holds a BA in biology and environmental science from the University of Virginia, an MS in marine science from the College of William and Mary, and a PhD in marine science from the University of Alabama. Beth has lived in Wilmington since 2014 and also taught classes and led research project projects in UNCW's Department of Biology and Marine Biology for four years. She's interested in water quality, marsh ecology, and exploring how humans can sustainably fit into the coastal environment. Nancy Basovny, who will speak after um, Dr. Darrow, is the founder and coordinator of Pleasure Island Sea Turtle Project which or organizes volunteers, educates community members, and records data about nesting sea turtles on the island. She is one of Pleasure Island's local heroes, and she is also a paddleboard and kayak guide. And I'll go ahead and turn it over first to Beth. Welcome. Well, thank you so much, Virginia, for inviting me today, and um, it's nice to join you all. Hopefully one day soon we'll be able to be in person for these types of meetings. That'll be a lot more fun. Um, so um, as the lead of Bald Head Island Conservancy's science and conservation programs, I wear many hats. Um, so I definitely wanted to give recognition to our sea turtle program coordinator, Paul Hillbrand, who's the true sea turtle expert on Bald Head Island. And he's the lead of our sea turtle program. And a number of these beautiful images are his. All right, so today I'll spend most of my time taking you through what the Conservancy's nighttime tagging program is all about. It's a little different than some of the other programs here in, in Southeastern North Carolina. Uh, but first I wanted to give a brief overview of sea turtles in North Carolina and an introduction to our organization and an overview of our program. So then we'll discuss sea turtle tagging and why it's important what the process involves and touch on what happens during hatching season, which I know Nancy is very familiar with as well. Um, and then we'll talk a little bit about some of our research collaborations and a new project we have been leading this year. And forgive me if you know this, this is kind of uh, rudimentary for some sea turtle enthusiasts, but um, it's really interesting to me to, to know that there are only actually seven species of sea turtle in the world. And they've been around for millions of years. They're ancient reptiles, uh, but they're currently facing a number of threats, including coastal development, erosion, sea, sea level rise, and predation. Uh, what's interesting is that in North Carolina, we actually have five of the seven species of sea turtle who will who live in our waters and will nest on our beaches occasionally, some of them only occasionally and some of them more often than not. The ones that nest most often in North Carolina are the loggerhead sea turtles in the lower left there, followed by green sea turtles in the middle. Occasionally we'll get the big guys, the leatherbacks, um, and they do migrate and forage offshore. So sometimes you may be lucky enough to see those. And then last year, we actually had a Kemp's Ridley nest on Bald Head Island, which was pretty exciting, but pretty rare. Here's our loggerhead. So um, as I mentioned, 99% of the turtles that nest on Bald Head Island are loggerheads. And they are pretty old at maturity. This is one of the reasons why they're under threat. They don't reach maturity until 30 to 35 years old in our area. 
Um, and an individual female might only nest every two to four years. So it's important to protect each mom is like gold to us, very special lady. And um, each mom can lay one to six clutches of eggs in a single reproductive year. And each of those eggs might have 100 to 150 eggs per clutch. So that means that each mom is pretty prolific, um, but it's understood that each one of those little baby hatchlings probably isn't gonna make it to adulthood. So we need to do as much as we can to try to protect the moms and the hatchlings um, as they get out there into the, before they get out there into the big ocean where we don't have as much control. Um, in North Carolina, we don't have as much nesting activity as areas further south, like Florida, where they might have tens of thousands of nests per year. Um, but our state is important to sea turtle populations because we're one of the northernmost areas, especially for the loggerhead to nest. We also have large stretches of good sea turtle nesting habitat, our barrier islands along the coast. Um, and being one of the most, the northernmost areas where sea turtles nest, it's thought that North Carolina contributes a significant portion of males to the sea turtle population. And that's because as reptiles, they actually, the, the temperature that the sand is where, when the eggs are incubating is what determines the sex of the hatchlings. So males tend to be dominant in cooler sands and females tend to be dominant in warmer sands. So you can see why it's important to still have good nesting habitat at the northernmost edges of the range. And if we also think about potential climate change in the future, you know, perhaps their range might start expanding further and further north if um, waters are warming. Uh, in 2019, North Carolina got a spe special designation from Governor Cooper designating the week of, was it June 16th, I think, was North Carolina Sea Turtle Week to recognize the importance of our sea turtle populations as well as the efforts of the different organizations working to conserve sea turtles in the state. Um, and in southeastern North Carolina, we're just one of a number of different sea turtle monitoring programs. So the Pleasure Island program is one, and here are a bunch of the other programs in southeastern North Carolina, and they've all been around since, you know, kind of around the 1980s, and that's going to be important. We'll discuss that a little bit later on. But our program was founded in 1983. So Baldhead Island, if you're not familiar with it, is the southeastern tip of North Carolina. Can't go any further southeast um, once you get to Baldhead Island. So if you're on Pleasure Island, just keep going south. Right now, we are still connected to the Pleasure Island Peninsula, but sometimes there's an inlet that comes and goes along Fort Fisher Beach, and that's why we're called an island. Baldhead Island is called an island. Right now, we're technically not an island. You could, if you wanted to, walk all the way up to Fort Fisher from Baldhead Island along the beach. But Baldhead Island Conservancy has been in place since the 1980s, and that's before there was a lot of development on Baldhead Island. Uh, we're at the mouth of the Cape Fear River, where it meets the Atlantic Ocean. And currently, there are about 1,100 homes on the island and about 200 year-round residents. So we have kind of a unique orientation where we have three beaches called West Beach, South Beach, and East Beach. And most of our sea turtle nesting activity occurs on South and East Beaches where we are bordering the ocean as opposed to the river. Um, the goal of the Conservancy has been since it was founded to um, champion the sustainability of barrier islands, including the sea turtle populations. And we are well known for a sea turtle program and some people call us the sea turtle conservancy, but we do a lot of different types of research and conservation as well, as well as education. Uh, so the sea turtle protection program actually began before Baldhead Island Conservancy began. It um, was started in 1980. Uh, the monitoring program and research was begun by some researchers and graduate students from UNCW. And then it moved to the Conservancy in 1983. And we're an index beach, which is a detailed standardized nest trend monitoring program. So that means that we use a standardized data collection protocol to measure nesting. 
and to allow accurate comparisons across beaches in between years. And all this is coordinated by our state coordinator, Dr. Matthew Godfrey from the North Carolina Wildlife Resources Commission. I know he gave a talk a few weeks ago, so um, he's the expert on all things statewide in sea turtle protection and conservation and the long-term trends. So, you know, our perspective here is just the, the more local perspective, uh, but he's our boss. Um, we also have a saturation tagging program. So what that means is that we attempt to encounter, tag, and identify each nesting sea turtle that comes ashore. So a lot of the programs are primarily a dawn patrol program where they'll search the beaches every morning. It's very, very labor intensive, especially for some of these islands that are very remote. Um, and they're looking for tracks like the ones you see here in the background. I'll show a better picture in a sec. Um, looking for tracks, they'll try to locate the nest. They will mark the nest, protect the nest, but they don't usually encounter the mom because the moms come up at night. Uh, but we're trying to encounter each mom to look for tags, to identify each mom and to take measurements. Um, so that means that we are con conducting full night patrols. So from around 9 p.m. to 6 a.m. every night, May to September. And we're attempting to encounter and collect data on each nesting female. So this will allow us to understand more about the life history of these animals, including how often they remigrate to a certain beach, what the distance is between their nesting locations and their, their clutch frequency. And then this will then allow scientists to extrapolate. They can take that nesting data and try to make estimates of the population as a whole to say, how many turtles do we have? Are our conservation me measures being successful? Um, are we being effective in our conservation that we're doing? So we do this with an intrepid, intrepid team of six college age interns who are very energetic and our coordinator, Paul, who conduct these nighttime patrols. I get to be daytime, lucky me. And here's our 2019 team. They're super hardworking. And here you can see, now that it's not dim, what the sea turtle tracks would look like. It looks kind of like tire treads. Each uh, species of sea turtle has a slightly different track pattern. So this is a loggerhead. You can see where she came up the beach and the little hole at the back of the base of the dunes is where she dug her nest and then she exited the other side. Sometimes that hole, that, that nest that she's covered up, She's done a pretty good job of disguising, so it can take us a while to find the nest if we're not there when she's laying it. So the goal is to drive down the beach and actually catch her in the act instead of coming up on it the next day. So the team drives in two UTVs, like all train vehicles, looking for tracks like those, watching for a mom laying her nest. And um, when they encounter a nesting female, they'll stop to collect data and we use only red light to reduce the stress in the nesting moms. Um, and it is important if you're visiting nesting beaches at night to only use red light so we don't blind them or scare them off. Uh, the mom digs her nest and the team waits. And then once she starts laying her eggs, she enters a trance-like state. I think they call it nature's epidural or something where she doesn't really mind if you mess with her a little bit. It's not as stressful to her. So the team can jump into action and start taking measurements at that point. Um, so the first thing that they'll do is check for tags. So tags, we have a couple different kinds of tags. There are external tags and there are also internal tags called a pit tag, which is more like the microchip you might put in your pet. It's about the size of a grain of rice and that internal tag, you know, won't fall off. So we have a scanner, like a barcode scanner, where we're checking to see if this mom has already been tagged. We're also looking for external tags, which are like a metal ear piercing that go on the flipper. So here in the shoulder, he's checking for a pit tag. And then if she doesn't have tags on her flippers or if one's fallen out, then we'll need to apply flipper tags to the kind of, I don't know, armpit area of the, um, of the flippers. After that, we take measurements. So we'll do curved carapace measurements using a soft measuring tape. We'll also use these giant calipers to take length measurements. And it's really cool to look at this data through time as these moms come back, because they do actually continue to grow even as they're adults. So we can see them increasing their size slightly through time. 
And then finally, we'll take uh, an egg for DNA. So when she's all done laying, we'll take one egg out of each nest, and that is used to look at the genetics of that mom and see to really identify who each mom is, especially for the sea turtle programs that don't encounter the mom. That's really important. It's basically molecular tagging of the animals. We try to remember to throw a fishing bobber into the nest. This is a very technical piece of equipment that is attached to a string. We toss it in there, hope she doesn't notice, and then she'll start covering the nest. And that's to make sure that we can find it later because sometimes they do a really good job disguising it. Here's a little video of her covering her nest. Hopefully it is working. And it's really cool to watch them use their flippers. They use them almost like hands. They're very, um, very sensitive and bendy and she'll pick up scoopfuls of sand and cover that nest and really use a lot of care to disguise it. Sometimes they'll even get pieces of plants and vegetation and cover the whole thing up. And then she will make her way back down the beach to the ocean. The whole process can take an hour or longer, depending on how experienced the mother is and if she encounters any obstacles. Um, sometimes the mom comes up on the beach and decides the location isn't right for whatever reason. She'll turn around without laying the nest. So it can be kind of deceptive. You'll see those tire tracks going up, tire tracks going back, but there's no nest in the middle. And that's called a false crawl. Um, and sometimes it's, it's just caused because she doesn't, I don't know why, she doesn't like the spot or the sand's not right. Uh, but sometimes it can be caused by an obstacle on the beach, like a scarp that's too uh, steep for her to climb or by encountering a human or a predator or something else that spooks her. So that's a good reason not to use, you know, not to interfere with a turtle. It's actually illegal to interfere with them, but we don't want to prevent them from nesting. So, um, you know, it's, it's good to keep your distance and let her do her job. So after the nests are laid, uh, it comes the dirty work. So we use predator exclusion cages on Bald Head Island. Some programs use a screen to keep predators out. It's a flat screen on the ground. And then down in Florida, when, where they have tens of thousands of nests, they can't even, they don't have the ability to cage that many nests. So not every place uses the cages. But the cages that we use have a skirt, they're dug into the ground. Um, so placing the cage involves digging a trench around that nest, placing the cage and then reburying the skirt. And sometimes the nest is not laid in an ideal location. So if it's in an area that could be precarious, that could be washed away or flooded too much, we'll move the nest to a more appropriate location as near as possible to the original spot. And we do this in close communication with the state coordinator because the goal is to move as few nests as possible. Um, but we will do that right after the nest is laid. That's why we have that bobber in there. She leaves and we go, okay, this is not a good spot. Make the decision to move it. And then each egg is very carefully put into a cooler, being careful not to move it or change its orientation. And then a, uh, a nest in a more appropriate location is hand dug and those are put back into that nest in the same order and orientation and buried. And we've had really good success at, um, you know, doing this successfully and carefully and, you know, you don't want to shake up those eggs or destroy those little embryos. So um, it is a successful conservation measure to try to make sure that those whole nests aren't washed away in, in storms or high tides. So another thing that our patrol does throughout the nesting season is, you know, while looking for nesting moms, also being on patrol for other threats to sea turtles, such as predators. And um, here are a couple of our recent predators. On the left is a red fox, and on the right is a coyote. A predator can dig up and destroy an entire nest. And the conservation plan for the, the state or for the species, I think, is to try to have less than 12% loss of eggs to depredation. Um, the dominant predators can vary depending on location. Down in the south, armadillos are a real problem. Uh, we don't have those here, but we've just recently, in the past few years, started to have issues with coyotes. So coyotes are non-native to North Carolina, non-native to the beach, the coast. Um, but they've been expanding their range and they've discovered, at least on Baldhead Island, that sea turtle eggs are a tasty snack. So 
In 2018 was the first time that we saw coyote interest in sea turtle nests. They were digging up some of the cages that were left unprotected after Hurricane Florence. Uh, and then in 2019, we had a huge sea turtle nesting season, which was great, but I think it was also kind of a stimulus for the, the coyotes. Um, we had really huge losses to coyotes that were infiltrating the cages that we were using at the time. And a good amount of the time on patrol was spent scaring them off and repairing cages and trying to rescue whatever hatchlings were left. Um, in 2020, there was still, um, here's a little graph showing coyote activities per day. In 20, 2019 and 2020, they try to write down whenever we see them, trying to mess with our turtles. Um, so 2019 is the blue and 2020 is the orange. So there was definitely some peak activity in 2019, you know, in July, August. And in 2020, we had just as much activity on the beach, but it was a little more spread out and they just were not as successful. So some of the measures that we're starting to take seem to be helping, um, but they're still out there. And it's something that I think probably a bunch of different programs in our area are going to have to start dealing with if they are not already. All right, so in July, between 45 and 70 days of incubation, the hatching start, I'm starting a video here, hope it works. And this is many people's absolute favorite part of visiting Bald Head Island and of the sea turtle season. Uh, the little babies coming out of the nest. So once the eggs hatch, the hatchlings will actually stay in the nest and wait until everybody's hatched or most of them have hatched and uh, then they'll all come out together and it's called a boil because it looks like a pot of water boiling over. Um, and once this group of little hatchlings emerges, sometimes you might have some stragglers. You can see them sliding down on their bellies. They're super cute. Um, but we are really lucky to have a group of volunteers on Bald Head Island, our sea turtle nest monitors, who help us monitor these nests and keep watch. They're like the midwives of the sea turtle world waiting for the hatchlings to start, and then they'll let us know uh, so we can get out there and protect them and keep people from stepping on them and dogs from <laughs> picking them up and things like that. Um, so it's a lot of fun. Usually hatching events, you know, you can never predict when they're going to happen. They usually happen at night, but sometimes we'll have one during the day that people can watch and it's, it's very cool. Uh, three days after the hatching, we'll have a nest inventory or an excavation. And we try to also use these as educational opportunities. So our nest monitors there on the right got to help with the excavation. They got to help get some of the little, sometimes there's some stragglers in the nest and they get to pull those out and release them, which is pretty fun. Um, on the left are some of our interns. So what they're doing is they're counting every hatched eggshell and this allows us to give statistics on the number of eggs in the, in the nest and their success, their hatch, um, their hatch frequency, their, sorry, their emergence success and their hatch success. And if there's some babies in there that we get to release, that's fun too. So I'll just give a, a little overview of a few of our research collaborations. Um, I mentioned the eggs that we remove. We remove one fresh egg from each nest and those get sent to Dr. Brian Shamblin at the University of Georgia and He's leading a project throughout the entire, what's called the Northern Recovery Unit, which is the subpopulation of nesting sea turtles that's north of Florida. So from Georgia to Virginia, um, we have a, a group of sea turtles that tend to kind of nest in this general area. And what he's doing is he's taking all those eggs, he's extracting the DNA from the shell of the egg, which will give us the mom's DNA that's kind of sloughed off as she's laid the eggs. And um, this has allowed us to see really important and interesting things like, you know, we have every of our moms tagged, but not every mom comes back to Bald Head Island specifically. Sometimes she may miss, <laughs> she may end up on Oak Island or Carolina Beach or Fort Fisher or even South Carolina. And this allows the team to see how far some of these moms are actually going to nest and it's really changing our ideas about that whole idea of coming back to the beach where they were born. Um, not everybody does that. Maybe 20% of them really straggle and, and move to 
all kinds of different beaches, which might be a good thing. It might be good for them to kind of move and mix their DNA around and mix their populations. It might be good for diversity. So that's been a really cool project to be involved with. Um, from those same eggs, Brian shares some of the, I think the yolk of the egg with Dr. Simona Seriani, who looks at the stable isotopes of those eggs for um, diet analysis of sea turtles. She also does a lot with satellite tagging of sea turtles to look at how sea turtles migrate. Um, I mentioned that we are working on this CAGE project. Uh, we're collaborating with UNCW and Fort Fisher on that. I'll talk about more of that, more of that in a sec. Uh, we've also been collaborating with the Lohman Lab from UNC for a number of years, and they've been looking at the behavior of navigation in loggerheads to determine if they use the Earth's magnetic field to migrate or how they actually sense and determine where, where they're going to get back to their nesting location. And then recently we've been working with Dr. Wilson Freshwater from UNCW who is looking at genetics of the algae that grows on the sea turtles shells. So he hypothesizes that it might actually be a specific species of algae that only grows on sea turtle shells, which is pretty cool because he's found that there is a sponge that only grows on sea turtle shells. So we will stay tuned. We'll let you know. Um, one thing that we're starting to dig into, which is I think the coolest thing about working at a place that has such long history of nesting is that we have data for 30 plus years and we can start to look at some really long-term trends and start answering some questions about you know, impacts of beach management, potentially climate change, or maybe our conservation efforts on these sea turtles. So one of our interns last year was able to dig into our historical sea turtle data, clean it up, and actually put geographic locations on each one of the nests, which is pretty impressive considering that our data comes from before GPS. So GPS, we didn't start using GPS units until the late 1990s. But he went through and looked at people's written notes and landmarks and um, we didn't even have beach accesses back in the 1980s and he even talked to some longtime residents of the island to say which house is this that they're talking about that this nest is a quarter of a mile from and um, it was just a huge effort but uh, what this allowed us to do is look at and create graphs like this that show that you know from the 1980s until early 2000s the number, the trend in nest numbers was decreasing through time. And, you know, there's a lot of variability from year to year. And that's because each of those moms comes back only maybe every two to four years. So you can get these kind of weird spikes and valleys from year to year. But that decrease to maybe 40 nests per year in, in 2005 was kind of concerning. But from 2005 up to 2020, um, we've actually had a positive trend. So we think that these trends are real. We don't know if they represent a long-term 30-year, 25-year maybe fluctuation, or if possibly the protection efforts that we and a lot of the organizations in Southeastern North Carolina started in the 1980s, if maybe now they're starting to come to fruition as these moms who were babies back in the 1980s are now maybe starting to reach maturity and starting to nest for the first time. So that would be really cool. So we'll see. Okay, and then finally, um, just to plug our most recent project, this is a project that Paul Hillbrand is leading from the Conservancy. It's funded by North Carolina Sea Grant. It's just a one-year project, but we're looking at the effectiveness of different cage types in keeping the, the major predator, which is now the coyote on Bald Head Island and Fort Fisher, uh, from consuming our nests. And, the top picture there is what it looks like, what it looked like in 2019 and be so sad coming down the beach and you see how this cage has just been ripped into and the whole nest has been dug up and scattered shells everywhere and remains of hatchlings. It was just it was really depressing for our, especially our interns who work so hard. Um, but we suspected that part of the reason for that could have been the design of those cages. You can see that the size that black plastic mesh is maybe a little flimsy. Uh, we had moved away from using a metal cage because of that magnetic research that the Lomans were doing. So 
uh, we wanted to not use something that was maybe ferromagnetic that could either interfere with their research or maybe interfere with the hatchling's navigation. We don't know. That's It's all kind of speculation. So we were trying to use a plastic or at least a non-ferrous material. Um, so we are trying a few different designs right now. This winter, we have tried four different cage designs. We put them on three beaches, including Fort Fisher. We put fish bait in those and controls. Obviously, there are no sea turtles nesting right now, but um, we wanted to try them out to see if the coyotes were even interested, if they could get into them in the winter time. Uh, and then this summer, we're gonna take the two best cage designs and use those with the sea turtle nests. So hopefully we can start to see an improvement in the, the protection of those nests. Um, so we're doing daily checks during, during this experiment, we do daily checks for depredation and infiltration. And we also have cameras up and uh, Dr. Urbanic from UNCW has a graduate student who's analyzing the photo data set for behaviors to see how they react to the different cages. And so far we're finding that the most effective material is this plastic material called MasterNet, which is used for airport fencing and it's produced in Canada. <laughs> um, it's expensive and kind of hard to get. So that is also gonna be a consideration. You know, when we write the final report, we're gonna include how much time it takes to create the cages from the material. My cat is leaving. Um, and, and the expense of the material. So we will share those results with different organizations when we have them hopefully in the next few months. And that is all I have. So if I have time for questions, I'd be glad to take them. Awesome, thank you so much, Beth. Um, there are quite a few questions, so I'm gonna go through just a few of them and then we'll switch it over to Nancy so she has a chance to share a little bit more about what um, she would like to talk about tonight or today. So. We have a question from Katrina. What are survival rates like? Uh, of the cage, oh, sorry, the cage um, nest. So usually our hatch rates are 75, 80%. They're pretty good. Um, and, you know, it, as long as you can keep the predators out, usually, you know, most of those babies actually get out to the ocean. What happens once they get out to the ocean? We don't really know. I've heard reports that only one in 1,000 hatchlings then reaches maturity to come back and nest, but that's a really hard thing to study because they're out there in the in the big ocean. Awesome, thanks. Um, Ness is asking, where do the other two species of turtles live? So the flatback turtles live, they're the Australian flatbacks. They live in the Indo-Pacific. Actually, both of them live more in the Pacific area. So the Australian flatback and the olive ridley are more Pacific species, Indian Ocean species. Awesome, thank you. Uh, Katrina is also asking, I remember there was a house bill passed several years ago to limit what sorts of ocean rise and climate change studies NC could use. Did numbers of sea turtles or survival rates of hatchlings fall while that law was in place? Uh, no, not necessarily. That So, you know, climate change and sea level rise is a really long-term phenomenon that is gonna really take us decades probably to understand those impacts and then to make a link from a policy that was made here in North Carolina to whether there was an impact on climate change and then whether there was an impact on sea turtles would be a pretty tough connection to make. Um, I will say that we are seeing some changes in sea turtle behaviors from climate, probably from climate change. It seems like they are nesting earlier in the season. They're beginning to nest earlier in the season, probably because the beaches are warmer earlier in the year. Whether that's a negative impact or not, we don't know. It just seems like they're they're shifting earlier. But I don't think it's related to policy changes. <laughs> that's a good question, though. Awesome, thanks. And uh, Katrina followed it up with saying, and we talked a little bit about nest predation. So 
She says, when I was in college, I did research on nest predation by habitat in Raleigh. I used quail eggs and water from a turtle tank. Is similar work being done at the coast with either real or artificial nests? Yeah, so we talked about using chick. We, we actually, one of our trials, we tried using chicken eggs. Um, and we were told by some trappers that we know that the coyotes don't really care about chicken eggs. I don't think they're maybe stinky enough <laughs> for something that they're, they don't have the same smell as turtle eggs. So uh, we used fish, stinky fish, like what you'd find on the beach. We'd seen coyotes digging up fish in the past. We figured that would be a good stimulus for them. It's not exactly sea turtle. But our initial trials, we just wanted to get them to interact with the cages in some way. So fish was the closest thing we could find to something natural. But I've heard of using quail eggs, and I've heard of using other artificial scents and lures that can work, too. Awesome. Just two more questions here. Um, are there specific precautions in place to prevent hatched turtles from running into the cage or digging it up and creating sharp ends uh, and injuring themselves? Yeah, so one of the considerations that we make is to make sure that the spaces in the cage are large enough for the little hatchlings to come, come out. So that has to be a characteristic. And there aren't really sharp ends that face inside. There are some maybe sharp ends that could you know, snag you if if you're touching it. So we, we always wear gloves when we handle them. But, yep, they're coming out, and it's all sort of flat and square on the inside so they can just come on out, kind of like a playpen, but with larger holes. <laughs> awesome. Thanks. Um, and then Bev is asking, how environmentally safe are those plastic cages? Right. So that is something that ideally we – start considering as well. So we don't want a material that's going to slough off microplastics all over the beach. I think if I had my preference, we would be making something out of more natural materials or potentially the metal because it's not going to leach um, microplastics. We're starting to use things like reusable zip ties when we're creating the cages, but that's definitely a consideration as well. So all those things have to be weighed by whoever is managing that particular nesting population. Awesome. Thanks for elaborating on that. Um, okay, we have one more question here. Uh, you said hatchings wait until all are out of their shells. Um, until most are out of their shells. So I don't know. We don't know how they communicate exactly, but we know that there's activity going on in the nest and they are they're coming out of their shells and they're moving to the top of the nest chamber. And I think some programs, I'm not sure, do Pleasure Island, Nancy will have to tell us, um, some programs actually use a stethoscope and they'll listen in the nest and they can hear the hatchlings moving around. Um, so they will, they'll, they'll tend to wait until kind of everybody's ready and then they'll all go at once. And that's a, a way to avoid predators or have less likelihood of everybody being eaten by a predator predator avoid, avoidance, but a lot of times there's still some guys down in the nest who maybe aren't as able to get to the top of the nest or have some issues. So sometimes they need a little help, which is we grab them when we excavate. And Nancy, do you have anything to add there? <laughs> no, we have tried the stethoscope occasionally. We can't really hear as well with it as we thought we could. So yeah. we same procedure, all the little stragglers come out with the excavation. Yeah. Awesome, thanks. And we'll get to more questions, but I'm going to go ahead and share a few pictures for Nancy and we will uh, let her take over for a minute. Hi, my name is Nancy Basovny and I am the permit holder for um, Carolina Beach and president of Pleasure Island Sea Turtle Project, which does Carolina, Curie Beach, and Freeman Park. So, uh, that's me at a nest I found on Freeman Park, and that's kind of a special nest to me. Uh, that was nest 20 last summer, which was a record breaker for us, and it was almost also my 20th summer of doing the turtles in this project, so it was kind of cool that I actually found this nest myself on my patrol, so that nest was very near and dear to my heart, and I was there when it hatched as well. Um, 
so we our procedures are very similar to ball head um we do not patrol all night like they do and um, we don't have a tagging program here so we get out and patrol every morning at six o'clock um, until recently we used a little vehicle but we started walking patrol last summer and that was so successful that we are going to continue that indefinitely so we do keep a vehicle to move supplies around or to carry people up to freeman park but otherwise we are walking the beach every morning at six um when we find nest we um uh, stake them off similar to what ballhead does uh with permission we do move nest uh, as of now, I move all nests off of Freeman Park because it is a vehicular beach. Uh, so that nest that you see me at, um, that one was moved to a safer location in Carolina Beach. Um, all of our nests are assigned a team with a team leader. So every nest has a nest leader and a team of about 15 people that will sit on that nest and keep an eye on it pretty much for the whole time until it hatches. So our nests are very well monitored. Uh, you can see here, this is um, one of the nest teams. Uh, we are also getting ready to do an excavation of um, that nest as well. Um, we are very hands-on, so our nest leaders and their teams get to do the, um, the excavations. Um, so it works out really well. We have a very large population of volunteers, so everybody pretty much gets to help. Um, as far as caging goes, we have similar predators to ball head. Um, for the fox, we were able to use plastic mesh and that worked really well until the coyotes came on the scene. So we've been experimenting with different cages to try and work with, um, work with the coyotes. And I'll be very interested to see what um, you guys come up with with the cages. That might be something we'd like to emulate down here. Uh, considering how densely populated our island is, there are a lot of coyotes here and they are definitely a problem. Um, so we report to Matthew Godfrey, um, just like Ballhead does, and are subject to the same rules and regulations. And um, here we are at a complete excavation. Um, we count all the eggs and all the live turtles and pretty much get all the information from the nest. And then I upload it to a program called seaturtle.org. So it's a website that you can go to and look at all the stats from all the different beaches. So every single nest, including the GPS location, uh, the excavation data, when it hatched, um, pretty much everything goes up there. So that's where we record our data. Um, so it's a, we, we have a fantastic little project. I've been in it for the entire 20 years that it's been in existence. Um, and we just keep growing and learning. Um, I tell the volunteers every summer brings something new and different. <laughs> it's always an adventure being out there. That is a picture I took of a nest at sunrise. I love the hatchings, but I also love being on the beach and walking patrol and watching the sun come up and looking for these beautiful tracks. And that's pretty much a classic nest. Um, you can see where the tracks crisscross and just beyond that um, is the nest. We rarely encounter our turtles um, because we aren't out there all night, but the police are really great. Uh, when they patrol the beach, they, uh, they call me and I'm able to get down there along with the nest team to, uh, to watch the turtle. And although we don't tag, we do check for tags just like Ballhead does and, and do measurements and gather data about the turtle. And there's a little hatchling uh, that we pulled out of the excavation. Um, they uh, like, it, um, as mentioned, um, excavations will occasionally have a few little stragglers in them that didn't make it out with the bulk of the hatch. So this is when we release them and give them a chance. So that's pretty much it, but I'm happy to answer any questions about our project. Awesome, thank you, Nancy. Uh, let's see, let me head back into the chat and we'll uh, look up some more questions. And if you do have a question, you can also press the raise hand feature and I'll call on you and you can unmute yourself and ask your question. Uh, so let me just run in here really quick. How deep do the cages go? 
Um, our cages are buried about, let's see, one to one to foot to 18 inches into the sand. So um, it's pretty, doesn't sound that deep, but when you're out there in the hot sun, <laughs> I'm like, oh, you guys, I feel like a grave dig digger out here and digging trenches. Um, yeah, so then we, we have to do all the way around and probably about a foot wide as well on all sides. Awesome. Uh, Camille asks, how can I get involved with Pleasure Island Turtles? Turtlers? <laughs> Very good question. Um, once a year, we take applications. And if you go to our Facebook page, Pleasure Island Sea Turtle Project, we've actually got a link to the application up there now. Um, so we usually, we generally get between 100 and 200 applications every year and we accept about 50 volunteers. So we try and keep the group size at just under 300. Um, so yeah, if you want to give it a shot, shoot us an application. Awesome. And then Donna and Artie are asking, do the hatchlings tend to stay together when they get into the ocean? Am I still muted? Am I muted? No? Am I good? Oh, no, you're good. <laughs> um, that's a great question. So unfortunately, hatchlings are really hard to track um, because they're so tiny. They we There is no way to flip or tag them. They're growing so fast that it's hard to apply a tag to their shells. Um, I don't think that they necessarily all stay together. If there's a group that's entering the ocean kind of at the same time, you'll see some of them you know, way down here, they kind of get pushed by the current and they have to get past the waves. And then once they're past the waves, they'll, they'll try to get into an ocean current to get out to the Sargasso Sea. And we do know that, but they're not exactly holding hands and staying with their buddies. I think kind of the idea is that they will disperse a bit so that they can, you know, their populations will disperse as well. Um, but I do have a colleague, Dr. Kate Mansfield from Florida, who is making some really cool strides in tagging juvenile sea turtles and starting to understand where they go during their lost years. If you do a Google search for sea turtles lost years, you can see some of the really interesting research she's been doing about what happens between when the hatchlings leave their beach and come back as moms. Um, and a cool part of the project was using nail acry acrylic from her salon. <laughs> Whoever her nail person recommended a certain kind of gel nail adhesive that works really well with tagging little baby sea turtles. So that's a really cool thing. Look up sea turtles last years. Awesome. That is super interesting. I like the cross dynamic there. <laughs> Good to um, right. Right. Uh, Bev is asking, how deep are the sea turtle nests? Uh, they're about 15 to 18 inches deep. So like elbow elbow length distance is kind of what we, we say. Nancy, is that, does that sound right to you? It is, especially for the loggerhead nest. Of course, right. green is a little bit deeper. <laughs> yeah. Awesome, thank you. And if people want to learn more, we're about about out of time here. So if there is any other questions that you would like to um, put in the chat or raise your hand, you can do that. But if people want to reach out to learn more about um, sea turtles or to learn or ask you questions that may come up after the talk, is there any way that they can get in touch with you? Or do you have any resources that they might like? Um, for us, we have a, um, a website, seaturtleproject.org, and there's a contact section there. Um, we have a few people that check that box. So if you have any questions for me, just um, direct them to Nancy, and I'll get to them. Yep, and we are bhic.org for Bald Head yeah. Island Conservancy, mm -hmm. and we have a number of educational resources on our page. We do a lot of education, so mm -hmm. if you're ever on Bald Head Island and want to take a tour, attend a class. Uh, we also do turtle walks in the evenings for our members. 
So that's a really popular thing if you wanted to get out there on the beach with our team and look for moms. Awesome, that sounds wonderful. Uh, we do have one other question here from Virginia. Are there any leatherback nests? Um, we had a leatherback nest in 2009, and um, that was the only one that's ever been recorded on Pleasure Island, and that was just a wonderful experience. You know, you saw pictures of the tracks. Uh, when we found that leatherback track, I literally laid down in it and had a foot above my head. It was just so huge, and then um, we were there for the hatch, and it was just beautiful watching those turtles coming out. Unforgettable experience. Yeah, we had one about 10 or 15 years ago, too, and I, I wasn't here for that. Um, and then I think Fort Fisher had one just a couple years ago, and we were jealous. And then um, last year, we had some leather ba leatherbacks just basking offshore, and people kept calling us, and we're like, come on! <laughs> but they just kept, they kept moving. So, you know, it is, it is a pretty special thing because they're so huge. That's awesome. Oh, it looks like Marcia has her hand raised. So Marcia, if you would like to unmute yourself and ask your question, you can do that. And the unmute button is just that little microphone icon if you are having trouble locating it. No, I was having problems putting on my headset. So I had a question for um, uh for uh elizabeth so when we do uh night midwifing on the south end of fort fisher uh is that the light we see uh, of your on uh, bald head when you're doing your night walks are you seeing red lights yeah we're seeing a a, a light on bald head right before the preservation area mm -hmm. Our, it's, our, probably, it's probably our headlights from our UTV because we don't usually take guests all the way up that far. Uh, usually we'll we'll try to take them out to an area that's a little more accessible in South Beach. So you're but you're probably seeing our team out there. We go up to the sign at the, the edge of the boundary there and turn around, drive down. Yes. So that's where we are too. Okay. So yeah. Jump out and say hi. I will. I will. Thank you. Pleased to meet you. Awesome, thank you. All right, and yes, Bev, we will have the recording out soon, um, hopefully by the beginning of next week or the week after, and it also will be posted on the North Carolina Wildlife Federation YouTube channel. Um, but other than that, thank you everyone um, for joining today, and thank you so much to Beth and Nancy for doing this wonderful presentation and to Virginia for organizing it. And I'll let Virginia close us out here if there's anything else you want to add. No, I just, I just want to say thank you so much to Nancy and Beth for coming out today. This was great and we will see you on the beach. Thank you for having Take care. Thank you. Bye-bye. Awesome, thanks everyone. Bye.